2022. Last week, we saw a demo from Dean about, I remember, it was about uh, yeah, background schedule. jobs. Schedule, schedule jobs. You need to share your screen, Sid. No way. I will share my screen. Okay. I'm sharing my screen. So, schedule jobs. Sebastian was supposed to do demo and didn't. Maybe today. We talked about RIS 1.2, to the issues, and GNF stats, status. Today, today, today. Demos. Okay. Peaks. One point two release. One point two point one release. What else? Nothing else. That's okay. I see a one here. I know I like I missed something, but I don't think maybe a bug. Um, so topics 1.2 release. Let's talk about it. So on Thursday, we released 1.2. Uh, okay. Cool. Releases. We released 1.2 with all these changes. Okay, so this was automated, generated by GitHub. We created the release, it tagged the main branch with 1.2.0, which published everything on NuGet. All these contributors participated in the release. Um, what else? Uh, Release notes. There is no link here, but on the documentation there is release notes which consist of that exactly. Nothing went wrong. Translations were released, uh, packages were released, Docker images were released on Docker Hub. Everything went well. Then on Friday we received um, vulnerability uh, notification security issue. Um, so someone, let's see, close. Someone find an issue. Must be around here, right? Fourth one down. Oh, as I type it. Yeah, get in touch. So where do we post security issues? So they suggested to create a security MD5, which I did. I put my email because that allows me to, if it's an issue, a security issue in ASP.NET, it allows me to trigger um, MSRC, which is a, a Microsoft security and follow the steps to fix ASP.NET. If it's something in Orchard, I ping everyone concerned, uh, all the main contributors and ask them for help uh, to fix the issue or I fix it. So I put my email on it. Uh, we might change it sometime, but I have no better option right now. Uh, so they sent me a link to a platform that lets them follow um, the, the, the fix and also, and also get some bug bounties, which is interesting. So I think it's called, I can't open the link because if I share the link, you will have access to the to the thing they shared. So, um, and you can change the status and everything. So I don't want, so the, the thing is called Hunter Dev or something. I, I need to find the website. Let me stop sharing my screen one second. How do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. You don't see my screen, right? Right. Oh, you're good. Thank you. So I will just copy paste the website itself without a URL. One second. 
last week, last week, last week, this one, yeah, I found the thing here. Let's see. Sharing my screen. Thank you. There might be a button to say like temporary. No, it's okay. So here the site is hunter.dev. There is bounty. So Product open source software. So they just filed a case there and that creates a private link that I can open when they disclose it. And I can say, I acknowledge the issue, we fix the issue, we release the fix, and so on. So interesting, right? And then there is that. So, and based on the projects, there, is, there are bounties. So I don't know how it's calculated. I don't know who's paying for that. That's interesting, but whatever, if I look for it, okay. Is, is log for j listed out of complete Sorry? curiosity? Hmm? Is it log for j listed with a bounty? Hold on, let me see. Well, first, maybe if it's on GitHub apparently, because it seems to be linked to GitHub. So all true CMS. Found it. Okay. Zero left to be claimed. Uh, cooling down. Two reports. I I just know about one. Okay, so if I click there, let me see the link. So we can't see, maybe it's not public, I don't know. Oh, maybe because I didn't click the, no, this clause is when you create a new one. I don't know how it works. Number of reports submitted against this repository. Yeah, show me the reports. I don't know how it works. I can click here. If I click there, it goes to the tab. Oh, these are bounties. So maybe there is no more bounties. So maybe here, there is a search. No, well, I will try to understand how it works, but. Uh, Two fifty monthly. So yeah, so I validated, I submitted, and apparently they got something like one fifty, one forty. And uh, even if you solve the issue, you get also a bounty. So when I solved it, it asked me to give me some to say who should get the money, and I say nobody. I just and it says it puts the money back into the pot for the next. Uh, so well, the next issue that is uh, resolved. So that, that's, uh, I learned about this. I did, it was nice. I liked the, the process because I could say, I acknowledge, I, I'm working on the fix, I fixed it. Here is the, the commit that fixed the issue. So just to say that, release 1.2, and then this morning, release one to one with just the fix. Let's look at the fix because it's public and you will see the different issues. Uh, so it has been published in the get. You can update to one to one. It affects all the version one zero one 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 two. We only fix one to one. Um, it's not critical in the way that only users that are authenticated and have access to the dashboard, the admin side, can do things. Um, even editors, I don't think they can't do anything. You need to be able to create content types, but you can also create layers which have the same issue. I think. Um, so here, so looking at the, the security issues and how to not have them anymore. These are accesses, which means you can inject um, custom JavaScript in a page that could be triggered automatically. And then if you inject some uh, fancy JavaScript, you can force a user to submit queries um, and on this side, you could extract uh, secrets or uh, have them do things that they don't want to do. 
on the site. So that, that's why it's bad. Uh, how do we prevent that is by doing an at on every. You, you, you should um, explain the issue with the content types. I'll yeah, just, I, I will. I yeah, I'm, I'm, people, but cool. I'm doing it first to explain the, the, the issue in general and then how. We, so how we solve that usually is that we encode everything we output, which means if you're th the thing we want to output contains some JavaScript, we will encode it such that it will be rendered the JavaScript will be rendered and not the JavaScript itself to execute, or same thing for HTML types. Um, so that's very common. Okay, we use the razor in razor everything we output, uh, like, 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 like something like this. Here it says whatever is the result of this translation will be encoded. Okay, um, it's not quite right. I need a better example, <laughs> but usually we are. Uh, with that. Yeah. If you do razor, you know what I mean. Everything is HTML coding. However, however, in this case here, when we do, I'd like to have a, a simpler one because translation is the second step after. Um, I can't find it, so I will start with that. So in this case here, the first case we see here, what, what was happening is that the translation was called on a variable. And if you followed this meeting for some time, you know that I don't like it at all because um, we can't translate it and, and it happens, it's also a security issue. So what's happening is that the translation, when we call T, which is the IHTML localizer in uh, student MDC. Um, it will look up for this text. If it finds the text in the translations, it will render this text. Um, it will render the, the translation. Otherwise, it will render this text as is. That's why we always pass the English versions such that if it doesn't find a localization, it will render this text as is in English. So we don't have to create the translation for English, we just use the key that we pass, fine. Uh, um, but something very interesting with the translator, here, the, the view localizer, is that this can contain HTML. Um, and that's how we do to translate notifications and uh, links, stuff like this. So this thing can contain HTML. And because it can contain HTML, the at before that will just render it as is. So whatever is passed there will be rendered as is and not encoded, or there could be a double encoding issue. So if I put some JavaScript, some HTML, whatever inside that, this text, this will really rendered as is and not encoded. So what happens there is that when we do, when we do any string like this, this is fine because we know this is the static string to generate the static html the static javascript so we know what we are rendering but when we do it in a variable this variable can contain anything and we don't know what it contains and if it's user inputted then it can be malicious so we should never translate a user inputted inputted value like this okay so what's happening here is this text here is this is a it is, is an encoding issue over a bug. It was contained, so item was um, something that is a list of select, so this is a list of select list item, which itself contained a localized string instantiated dot value, which is actually this thing. So I don't understand why even that, why it was using the localized string, so I'm, I just removed it. There is no reason to use a localized string here. Localized string is the result of the translation operation by the provider to just say this is the thing that was um, requested and this is the context. What is the, no, sorry. Yeah, this is the thing and this is a context. So there is no, oh, the thing and the translation. Yeah, and then give me the thing. So what's the point of using that? I don't know why it was there. Uh, I hope there was no specific reason, but I don't, I can't imagine of uh, any reason. We use localized string as a type when we know that the property needs to be a localized string and should be uh, assign with a, um, a call to T, for instance. Um, so, 
here. This one was from this controller, which was listing uh, the display name of the content type and the and, um, technical name of the content type. It's just a list of content types, and this is the like the new drop-down button. What new thing do you want to create? It lists all the content type with a display name and gives also the technical name. And this display name is the dot text, not the dot value of the select list item. So here we render at item.value in HTML, which is fine. Here it is just to inject a value, but this is valid HTML, it's a technical name, so we are totally fine with that. Um, but here, um, here we pass a display name. So if you put, and because it won't be encoded in this case, because we call it with a translation, if you put JavaScript or HTML inside the display of content type, you can trigger an issue. Okay, so that's the reason here. So the solution is two solutions. What we do usually for everything that is a variable, we don't translate it. That's the first solution. Don't translate it. We have designed and started the PR for dynamic content translations, which is supposed to fix that, to, to provide a solution to be able to translate content types, translate permissions, all the things that are user inputted and dynamic in database, not static text or not a content item localization. Okay, so we have a feature for that. It is designed. We should either not translate dynamic variables or use the, the new localization PR and finish it. Second option is to explicitly encode it. So I chose this solution in this just for this vulnerability because uh, this way it's not breaking anyone who provided some translations for content types and it's and it's secure because I'm explicitly translating the encoded value of the display name. So it will break people who have spaces in their content type display names because now they will have to translate full um, percent NBSP semicolon bar and before they will have to translate with the space but now now this will be encoded so they will have to adapt their translations but most of people who, who use uh, no spaces or no HTML or no JavaScript in their content type display name won't be impacted by the fix and in this case if you put some JavaScript or HTML in your content type display name it will just be displayed as the as is um, in the list of content types. So you will see the HTML in the output uh, encoded. Okay, so that's the, any comments, questions on this one? So yeah, it's very easy to repro, just in your content type display name, add some HTML and it will be rendered and executed. Um, so that, what else? And so to be able to edit that, you need to have the permission to create content types or to edit content types. So that's the mitigation, the limitation of the issue. Same thing here, another view that's doing exactly the same thing, using a localized string as the select list item. I don't understand. I'm, tell me if I'm missing something, because I really don't understand why you would put a localized string instance dot value, which is just a string, which is equivalent to that inside that. Or maybe it was expected that this to be encoded because of that. I don't know. Um, then, then here, another example. So when we use translations and we pass a string, this is totally valid, okay? Whatever is passed as an argument is, is replaced there. But the translation logic is to Um, yeah, that's interesting. So maybe it's related to that. Maybe this was encoded, but this would not have, not have triggered the thing, so I'm confused. Uh, so yeah, so the idea is that whatever is passed as an argument will be encoded automatically by the localizer. So we don't need the row. What the row means is that it's already encoded, don't encode it, it's safe. No, it's not safe. So here, I remove the row. It's not safe. This should be encoded all the time, okay? So the arguments should not be called with row unless you know that it is supposed to contain HTML and JavaScript. It happens, 
sometimes we render HTML and JavaScript, like the HTML body, like the Markdown body. We render HTML. This is what we want to do. We want editors to be able to type HTML, to type uh, JavaScript. And in this case, we call HTML.4. Okay. And in that case also, usually we sanitize it to remove anything that could be an issue and contain for site and scripting uh, things. So it's fine to call raw when we know it's validated HTML. Here, this is not validated HTML. This should not even be HTML. Okay, so remove the raw. The second issue, don't use raw when it's not intended HTML, which means if you were to go in the edit view of a content type, where you change the content type uh, to have um, XSS, the title will contain some custom JavaScript and um, HTML. Okay. Uh, this one, same as the first one, encode it, same as the second one. Here, model.message, I removed the translation altogether. I didn't even um, um, use HTML.encode because this message, uh, well, this is a demo module, no reason to keep it working. There is no reason to call translation on a message like this. So I just removed it because it could give people bad ideas. It's just a demo module, don't do that. This one is ambiguous. I removed it and I added it again, and uh, even Zoltan told me don't do that, but I'm like, it's safe now. So the idea is this one is particular because it's a dynamic string. Um, and this is kind of safe because this is an integer. And this is the percentage. I believe the idea of translating that is if we go lower here is to do the same thing as that. This is a static string, so this is totally safe. OK, you can't hack that. It's a static string. And I believe the goal of that is to be able to change what is displayed when in the flow part we want to render these percentages. For instance, like half, quarter, or like small, big, medium, I don't know, but might be a reason. And this is displaying what is a current selected value. So this is safe, but to be even safer, it's encoded. Okay. In case someone can hack the size property and put something else. Again, not to break anything. In theory, this should be ah, not sure it should be a dynamic value because, because it's supposed to be the list of values that are defined here. So this should be safe, but to be safer, I did. Um, here, this one though, I don't think it was reported, but now it's fixed. Um, it's creating a row string, which is some HTML, fine, but it's injecting a layer property, which I don't know where it can come from. So to be sure, we are encoding that. And it's um, I, by, while I'm reading it, I'm like, maybe I broke something, but it's an index, so it's not supposed to, it's just supposed to be displaying the name of the layer. So in this case, I'm not breaking any form, it's just encoding the thing. Because I'm generating HTML, and it's a plus, uh, so this should be encoded. Okay, so HTML encoding again. This one, um, same thing. I think it's safe, but I, I was uh, cautious. So uh, here it's taking the option. The option is actually the value of an enum, but it's taking from a variable, so we don't know. And in this case, this can only be enums, so I never do that. You just do a switch. Whatever is the option, you call with the T and the static string. I could have, by the way, replaced no registration with a space here, but it would have broken um, translations for existing strings that were translating that. So now it's fixing the potential security issue and not breaking anything. In the main branch, we should replace this string with a space, with a nice a text. So again, recommendation is when you have an enumeration, don't use the enumeration value as the T. Uh, enumerate all the switch, all the options in a switch and render everything. It's even better because the localization tool can extract the string and file the and and replace it in the PO file. Here, the PO file doesn't contain the string, doesn't know. Um, so it's like dynamic translation without dynamic translation. 
So the idea with dynamic translation is that when we, we will generate a new letter like D, today we have S for string, T for translating, but HTML, and we have a new one that will take a string, which will be a variable, and a second parameter, which will be a category, to say like, for instance, content type, uh, I don't know, uh, type of type of registration, something like that. And we have a, a view in the admin page that will allow us to see all the things that can be translated dynamically um, with the different values, and we provide a translation directly in the admin. And only the custom um, invoker can invoke existing values from these translations with the parameter. So this would be much safer. Um, that, this one here, same thing, action. This is a user task from a workflow. This can be user, this is user provided. We should not translate it at all, but it was translated. So here I decided to encode the action. Okay. Another option would be to have a string which is curly brace zero space and save. So one single string using that as an argument. Uh, that will have worked, but not translating, not being able to translate the value uh, still because it's a dynamic value. I didn't want to break anything, so I just used encode. And that's it. All the fixes. These are on the is 1.2 branch. This has been merged to the main branch. So um, if you're using the source code, you also have the fixes. Uh, comments, questions? And there are definitely more security issues. We just don't know about them yet. If you find some, please, we'll be happy. Um, good. That's for that. No questions, nothing. All good. Status since main, so I will return main. So last week, one four. Almost nothing. Wow. So this one, uh, this string update, this string library that lets us create string builder, but on the stack, so faster, less allocations, and we can still have a string builder. And this is an update to the library. Uh, this one is when we ship on Thursday 1.2. Shipping means updating the docs, creating the reason page, updating the the readme and docs to say use the 1.2 version, updating the constants here, somewhere here to ship new packages with new versions. Okay, and point to new translation. And today when I did the same thing, in the same files, new release notes, but the translations were not updated because we didn't change anything in the translation, so still pointing to the 1.20 translation files. Um, but everything else is the same. Okay. That was I. Here. Then on the main branch, so this is the merge, on the main branch, optimize slug service by Isham, so Isham refactor the slug service to make it better, simpler to understand, and uh, faster. And the benchmark, because it's very important. Um, update the readme for the release. I missed some things. I didn't change them. I still kept them to 1.2, even though it's 1.2.1, but the branch is the same. That's OK. Update development version 2.3 such that every module on end package on um, CloudSmith is now shipped with 130 dash something, beta something. Update on HTML sanitizer, security MD because someone wanted to report something. Uh, remove netcore 3.1, netcore app 3.1, and net 5.0 from the build, which means that if you take the main branch, it will only build with 
and next version will only ship with 6.0. The, the current one is 3.15060, but 6.0 being an LTS and shipped by many months now and with security updates already, patches. We are just targeting this one for the next one. It will make also Visual Studio faster, the local bits faster. The CI is faster because it doesn't have to build everything three times and run the test three times. Uh, so it's, it's supposed to be much faster. It is definitely much faster. I don't know by how much, but it has to be much faster. Update 3.2.2.10. And this one was hard because I kept you see, we went from 8 to 12 because I kept trying to fix everything and I couldn't fix everything. There was always something else to fix because there was a bug that was introduced with this version in Parlot. So it was impacting shortcodes, yes, SQL, and food. Sorry, and, um, yeah, and food, which was updated here. So now it's good. Reduce allocations in media token service and improve performance. Marco apparently did some profiling and found something to improve. Wow. What did he do in that first um, in the first file? I saw something there. That? Uh, yeah, he's made it static there. Hmm. Yeah, so you don't have to create a new because there is an arrow here. It will invoke that every time you access commands. So that's the goal. There is one. Oh, that's cool. We should we should do that for the um, permission providers as well. Um, okay. Because most of them are basically static. Hmm. Okay. Sorry. Another, another option is to have equal. If it's a, well, here is a it's a yeah, it's a property getter, but if you have a custom property backed with a get, then you should do equal. So this is a sign once and there is no more locations. But here, because it's an arrow, it will invoke that every time. That's why it's, yeah, so two options to do. Um, the, so I was saying the, the only time when it's not the case, there is a custom thing for readme spans that will actually point to a memory location and not return this thing every time. Something weird. Marco taught me also. Um, actually, I'd found the way to use read in span before, and then he told me, hey, use read in span when you do that, and I understood why. Um, bump image sharp, great. So now we have all the updates from image sharp. Uh, James provided the, the PR, so that's great. So perf improvements, bug fixes, much less allocation, supposedly, supposedly, so we should look into that because it was allocating a lot. We saw that in multi-tenant, it was creating buffers for every tenant, and images take a lot of space when they are um, manipulated, so it was taking a lot of memory. Now the, there are the buffers to read the images, they are pulled and so reused, that's much better. I, I don't it. think we got that in that release. Um, there was no update to image sharp itself, just um just the update to image sharp .web. Oh that was a change in the image sharp I see. So not yeah. this one. Then. Oh so this is just the fixes for the Yes, it only contains the fixes for the command evaluation uh, extension files that should not be processed and the looking. So okay. Still yeah. better. No, I think they're. I think they're it's still better. Um, I think they're pushing for a version two of Image Sharp, which will have that the the memory buffers, which will be great for us, and also okay. the um, uh, um some of the 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 new image image um, formats that they're supporting. Oh, the web app. Yeah. Cool. And if they don't update web after that, I think they will. Uh, we can still point to the Image Sharp library directly. Yeah, I'm sure he'll update that as soon as he can. Fix localizer type in tenant's API controller, so the localizer was wrong. Fix the typo. Update mail kit, mime kit. Remove unnecessary dependency. Uh, 
What did I remove? No, I just, uh, the na oh no, yeah, the name is wrong. It's just updating three to 13. Um, oh, no, no, yes, the name is right. It's just that when I ship to 112 of read, I added a dependency on something that is not required. So then I published 13 without a dependency and I updated it. Um, remove multiple completion path on blah, blah, blah. Yes, now we are on six. We can remove all the things that we're targeting, not six specifically. Okay, so there will be more than that. Media search indexing, um, so the indexing PDF files, for instance, and all other media. Okay. Merged. Um, that bit watch excludes to not watch everything that is not required to watch. Just now. Add response to a SMTP result. I don't know why, but some people who want to use that will have reasons. So apparently when you send a SMTP um, request, the response can be uh, read and someone might want to do something with the response. So we already know if it failed or not, success failed, but now there is even in the success, there is a response. Which is not known. We don't know what it contains, but it's not known. Remove exist checks for blobs. Um, so this one from Shane is about that instead of querying the blob that do you exist every time, we just try to get it. And maybe if we say no, not found. This way, if it's there, we we prevent one extraneous network communication to check if it's there before asking for it. So we just ask for it. Then if it fails, it fails. It's like not found. Okay. Pretty common issue is pop storage. Right? You need, because it's low latency, you need to do the you know, as few communications as you can. Shane Cotrill. Kellogg's update, Cypress update, security patch, and that's it. Good. Questions? What time is here? Representations. We found a bug. Okay. Um, demos. Announcements, whatever topics. Nothing. Okay, so I will show some new things. Some new things. I have two new things actually. Because we have time, so I will just do the. So the first thing that you care about, but the other thing you might not care about. So Fluid, um, I added a feature in Fluid. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about all the limitations of Fluid. And uh, now there is an optional feature. It's optional because Fluid is very close, to, well, as close as possible to the specification of Liquid, but Liquid doesn't have functions. But there is a new option in the fluid parser that you can say allow functions, okay? And maybe we could have all the allow whatever that we removed in fluid two from fluid one, like math operations, grouping and everything. I don't like it much. I prefer to be as close to liquid as possible because it's make, it makes it simpler, a simple language. If, it, if we start adding too many things, it won't be a simple language. Um, uh, Let's use C sharp. Okay, like C sharp has too many things, to my opinion, now, too many ways to do the same thing. Um, so, here, by saying allow functions, what we can do is call functions like this. Okay, identifier, parentheses, and arguments like JavaScript or like C sharp. Um, so, C like uh, functions with values and name values. Okay, 
So this is the first thing. And how it works, I think it's beautiful. Uh, this thing field is um, an object, a fluid value of type function value. So in fluid, anytime we access something like um, that name, this is a fluid value, in this case, of type string value. There is a number value, there is an array value, a Boolean value, and so on. Okay? So in this case, when we find field, field is a value of type function value, like in JavaScript. Okay? And a function value has um, implements the, the, the method name invoke async. So there is invoke async, there is get property async, there is con uh, contains, enumerate, and so on, all the things that an object can do. But this function value, when, it in, when it's invoke, invoked, it will execute uh, something. And to invoke a free value, you use parentheses. If I do parentheses on something like name, which is a string, I can do name, open parents, and close parents. It will try to invoke the string, but it will just return nil value. You, it won't even throw, that's that's safe by default, uh, like everything in liquid, it will just return nothing. So you can invoke name if you want, it won't do anything. If it's an actual function, it will actually do something. So in this case, um, field will be invoked with two parameters. Okay, And to add the field uh, function value, there are two ways. Either you create a new function value and you pass it as a context, like in this case, the lowercase um, C sharp object is a function value that gets a lambda to be evaluated with arguments and the template context. So you can say what to do uh, based on these arguments, um, lowercase in this case, and then you set the value, for instance, to lower with this function value. And in the template, when you call to lower and you invoke it with some arguments, this is this function that is invoked with the arguments, and the arguments can be positioned or named, like the any field arguments, in the, even in the filters, it's the same thing. So at or dot named, or using the indexer. Um, okay, uh, so that's it, how to set up a function. And there is also an extra tag called macro that lets you define, define functions from the template directly. So here, the um, syntax is name of the argument default value. So name is the name of the argument, okay? This is always name of the argument, it's not a value, which is different from when it's invoked. This is the name of the argument and this is a value. So name, value, type with default values. And then this is like any other piece of template. In this case, it's generating a field in a div with an input using the properties. Okay, and you can reuse this thing uh, across your template. This template, actually. If you want to reuse it across templates, you need to add this macro in an include statement to include the same piece of template from any other template. Um, so how to define local functions with that? Uh, can be super useful. Um, so if you want to use it, I, um, Right now, I'm not sure we can do that in Orchard. So Orchard has the version of free that contains that, but I'm not sure we can change it from, um, maybe we can, because yes, we, can, we have access to the parser by default, because we can customize a parser, so we might be able to do, to change the, and we have a custom parser, so we might be able to do that already without any code change to, to try it. Someone should try. I haven't tried, but if it's not the case, we need to change something in Orchard to be able to code into this argument from our project to say, yes, I want to load the functions in my templates. And then it's up to you to use it or not. I don't, I don't want Orchard to have that by default enabled, but it should be opt-in, I think. Um, good, that's functions. Questions, comments? Some. And the next thing that we might also want to enable in um, Orchard is that 
um, because we use feed and we use um, short codes and yes, SQL, but short codes has it automatically. So short codes, short codes. Dean is the real maintainer of the project. He does the thing. Um, short codes. No, it's not short codes. So data and parser, right? You said, so Dean said, told me that data and parser, and that's what was causing my issues, is compiling the parser automatically. So when we are in a tree, and we look at data and parser, which is used by all the trail. So this parser here, which is using parlot, um, to parse expression to order to filter by date. So the default instance of the parser is compiled. This is optional in, in parlot. You can have uh, the parser generator be evaluated as is, or you can even compile it to make it faster because it will compile some optimized code that will take shortcuts to parse stuff. Okay, so it's like on all the, the parsers I've tried, it's 20% faster than the non-compiled version. So Dean was like, let's compile it by default. I like to keep it an option because it's another step than just instantiating the tree, so it might be slower at the first time and uh, maybe take, take memory and there might be bugs also. So I, I'm, uh, I'm being it safe and I don't myself call compile uh, on my parsers. But Dean is like, you know, let's compile it. So it's faster by 20%. So in this case, that's fine. What I did in Parlot is a new feature that will do some kind of tiered compilation, like automatic compilation. So what's happening? that I'm, that I'm not even sure I documented it. I might not have documented it. Okay, it's not documented, but it's there. The ID is here, this one. The ID is that, where is the option? Where is the test? I don't remember. There is an option. Here, pass context. Okay. So when you create a new pass context to pass something, you can say compilation threshold, which is the default constant here, which is zero by default. Zero means never. But if you put a value like three, for instance, there, or in there, in your own value, if you put three, the, after the third time this parser is used, it will automatically compile itself and then every invocation will use a compiled version, which means all the first invocations don't require the compilation. So if you invoke the parser just once, there is no compilation, there is no need for that. But if you use it um, a few times, whatever the threshold is, then it will compile itself synchronously so the next compiler will be compiled. The other ones that are currently executed won't be compiled, just one at a time will be compiled. Uh, it's like a grace period. And then the next invocations will be using the compiled ones, okay? So you will get the auto compilation if you uh, benefit from that by setting a, a threshold. So in all trend, it's interesting because by saying, setting that on all the free templates, Every time we generate, uh, we, we comp if we compile a few free templates, if we parse a few, a few free templates, it will use the non-compiled version. But after a while, it can switch to the compiled version and then make the free parsing much faster. Might not be useful because we parse a lot, so we could compile it by default. But yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. Maybe we should try that at least. To, to see if we should compile the, the, the free parser automatically or by default. So that's the two things that are interesting in. Is there any memory usage on that compile? Oh, significant. It's, just because our parser is pertinent, so I wonder. The parser are, are pertinent? Yeah, they are pertinent. By general. So they are pertinent? Yes, because we have custom ties. So that's why I actually yeah, you, turn, you can turn features with tags on and off. So 
Let me show you actually. Uh, so yes, fast, fast compiler. It is slow and taking some memory, but I only enable the feature when I move to this library. Uh, it's funny because I had already played with that, and Isham mentioned that in a, in a tweet, I think, or in an issue. Like, oh, let's try that. Um, so it's, it's getting traction, it's using many projects. So this thing here, Fast Expression Compiler, is two different things, um, two different sets of libraries, but in the end, it's a re-implementation of the uh, expression tree evaluator from C Sharp, but faster and more optimized because the one in C Sharp is slow or in .NET is slow. So the idea is that you take, for instance, reference to that thing, and instead of doing compile on an expression tree, which will compile something, um, it will it will use, so there is a compile fast method that they provide that will use their own logic to visit the expression tree and generate the IL. Okay, so they have their custom implementation of the compile and they say it like it's 10 to 40 times faster than the standard .NET uh, compile. And in the end, you don't, change, you don't change your code, you just call a different method when you've built the tree. So as an example, uh, if I look into Barlet, just to, to be sure about that you understand what I'm talking about. If I take a parser, something that says, for instance, for instance, this one, because it's the one that I broke. Um, so this is the code that is executed when you don't compile, but if you compile, which is here, you see expression.block, expression.even else. So this is creating some, uh, let's say, C-sharp code dynamically, and then asking at the end to combine it. Oh, this is a new switch case, this is an expression, this is an if then else, and so on, okay? So instead of running the code, I'm, I'm describing the code to run and to compile in a more optimized way. Um, and then when you have an expression, like so an, an expression of T in this case, then you call compile of, on it, and C sharp will give you a lambda to execute. So it will give you a, a, a pointer to the code to, to run. And this thing does the same thing, but faster and, and, and better than uh, what .NET provides by default. I don't understand how it, but I mean, this is pure logic, but they must be clever to be able to, to do that. And I find an issue because I found a bug, but I, in the issue I filed, I also, here, I found an issue, but I also shared some benchmarks, so I will answer your questions. With the .NET version, to, to generate two different parsers, small and, and bigger, it was taking one millisecond, 1.3 millisecond before, and 200 microseconds after, no, before, okay, 50 and 10 kilobytes, so two different parsers. And now, using the fast com, com expression compiler, FEC, it's taking 75 microseconds and 15 microseconds. Okay, so from 200 to 15 and from 1.3 thousand to 75. So in this case, it's like 10 times, yeah, uh, 10, 12 times slower, uh, 12, sorry, 12, 12 times faster and uh, about the same thing, let's say. Okay, more than 12 times faster in this case. So this is the time it takes to build a parser and uh, to generate it. Now it's allocated. I don't know if it's um, recovered or if it's some static value, some static um, memory that will be kept. I don't know how much static thing will be kept. Pertinent. Uh, but that's the idea. So that's so, not, but now the version that does automatic compilation is using that. I didn't want to go with automatic compilation if it was taking that time. It's one millisecond, fine, but I mean, that's still one millisecond. Here it's like 75 microseconds. Okay, good. So I don't know for the read parser itself, definitely more than that or that, but I, yeah, I haven't benchmarked it. Uh, I think I have benchmark, but I don't remember the number. The numbers. That's the idea. Okay. So that's why I think it's fine to dynamically compile because it's 
the amount of time to, to do that is ridiculous. And it's done only once, so for the app. That's good. That was the question, right? How much memory? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking out loud, really. Um, it looks really good, doesn't it? Great. Um, good, 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 good. That's why I see demos, like related projects. Questions, comments? Beautiful. Um, if someone wants to look into it, that would be interesting to see if we can, now we are on .NET 6, remove JSON.NET and replace it with syntax.json because in 6, they have the, the DOM, the object model, the JSON object model um, that we use to manipulate the data and that we required Newtonsurf to do because this was the only one to have it. And uh, it was not in the .NET 5 or the .NET 3. We see syntax JSON, but now it's in the .NET 6. So if someone wants to try it and has nothing to do and wants to have fun, that might be interesting to see for Perf. Just an idea. Okay, so we are done. Thanks everyone. See you on Thursday for the actual triage because we did a release last Thursday. Otherwise, see you next week. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye.